Hello, I'm Robert Bailey, and I teach the history of contemporary art here at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, my talk today is titled Toward an Environmental Art History, and what I'm going to do is uh, record a short bit of audio um, and attach that to each of the slides here in the PowerPoint. So what you'll want to do is just click through the slides of the PowerPoint and listen to the audio um, as you go um, and follow along with what I have to say. So with that, we'll move on to the first slide. So one of the inescapable facts of our time um, is the uh, emergence of environmental and ecological crises and catastrophes. Um, and I've been very interested in how art history can respond uh, to those uh, uh, events, um, and in particular uh, to uh, um, climate change and to uh, what scientists are increasingly calling the Anthropocene. Uh, which is a new geological epic they're proposing um, that would replace the Holocene um, and would, uh, would signify the fact that humanity is now a geological force that shapes the earth um, through the things that we do to its surface, that we're leaving kind of the newest layer um, in the history of the planet. And so these two uh, images here are just meant to illustrate on the left-hand side, um, the Anthropocene uh, would be you know, all the people up top there. Um, who are going about um, their business on top of the planet's history below, which goes back 4.6 billion years. Um, and then on the right-hand side, um, an indication of, of climate change, uh, specifically through uh, global warming, um, showing the uh, temperature change uh, increasing um, over the last uh, 50 years here on planet Earth. So the planet's getting hotter. We're experiencing um, you know, more natural disasters like hurricanes and fires and things of that nature. Uh, we're pumping a lot of plastic into the ocean. Uh, we're, we're using fossil fuel and pumping a bunch of carbon into the atmosphere. These kinds of things, um, none of which on the surface seem to have much of anything to do with art or with art history. Um, but I think that's misleading to think that. I, one of the things that I'm going to talk about today is how um, we, can, uh, we can question that and actually see that maybe art and art history have a lot of things to say about um, our uh, relationship to the environment around us. Among the books that I've been reading um, recently um, are these two here, uh, one by the activist uh, Greta Thunberg, um, who may be familiar to you. She's one of the faces of the uh, um, movement um, to really rethink more or less everything about how we live in order to tread more lightly on the planet. Um, this is a collection of some of her speeches um, often to, uh, to you know, sort of very important gatherings like the United Nations or various uh, large gatherings to do with uh, uh, attempting to mitigate uh, climate change. Um, and I recommend reading those. They're very accessible, um, very straightforward and direct. Um, and I think uh, she's quite an effective speaker. Um, so I would check that out. But your um, actual reading for today was by an art historian um, whose name is TJ Demos. Um, and that essay um, has since been uh, uh, republished. It was originally published online um, on the Eflux uh, journal uh, website, um, which is a good journal for contemporary art if you're if you're interested in that. Um, but uh, it's since been been republished in a new book of his called Beyond the World's End: Arts of Living at the Crossing, and it's the cover of the book there. So if you're interested in reading more of T.J. Demos's work um, about ecological and environmental art. That's a good uh, good starting point. Um, and Deimos, uh, I think, is a really helpful person to read and to think with about the question of, of how art and art history relate to, um, to the environment and to nature and to ecology, um, because he does a good job, I think, laying out the range of approaches that um, artists and activists have taken in recent uh, years uh, to address themselves to their concerns about those things. Um, you probably uh, noticed that he, he talks about a, a wide range of different kinds of contemporary art, um, some of which uh, are very sort of blunt and direct and straightforward, like making um, protest posters that might have a slogan on them um, that's meant to uh, raise awareness or create uh, increased attention um, to a cause of some kind. Um, and then um, maybe more uh, complicated and creative kinds of projects, like some of the um, art that emerged out of the no DAPL protests at Standing Rock um, that were uh, about uh, an oil pipeline that was um, being built on uh, Native American land there. Um, 
and uh, and then then these kind of projects that uh, intervene in institutions, challenging the museums of the art world um, to be better with respect to um, how they're operating in relationship to environmental crisis. Um, and finally, concluding with uh, the um, ZAD group that uh, is really radically trying to re-envision how people live on the planet today. Um, so Deimos takes us through a nice tour of, of a variety of different ways that artists are politicizing their practice, um, often in, in close collaboration with activists to rethink, um, you know, using the tools, the creative tools that artists have, um, how it is that we might inform ourselves um, and change our way of life and change the institutions that we live with um, in order to be better stewards of the planet. I think he does a really good job of laying all that out. I hope you thought so as well from reading his text. Um, that's why I assigned it. Um, but actually what I wanna do with the rest of the talk today is suggest um, another way maybe of doing art history than the more kind of what I would think of as conventional way that TJ Demos is doing that. So click along to the next slide and we'll pick up that theme. So for the last several years, I've been asking myself a series of questions about what am I doing as an art historian um, in relationship to nature and to the planet and to um, the urgent need that we all be um, uh, greater, better caretakers of it. Um, and so among those questions um, are some of the, the, the ones here, like what is an art historian to do when the planet and the life that relies on it um, is in danger? Uh, you yeah, know, that's a, that's a, a big challenge. Um, you know, what if, uh, Greta Thunberg was an art historian, what kind of art history would she do? Um, so I asked myself those sorts of questions and I had this thought, um, I, I could do what TJ Demos does. I could write about the kind of art that he writes about and do it in much the same way that he does. Um, and that would mean, you know, identifying interesting artists who are making um, work that has to do with uh, nature or ecology or the environment and doing what an art historian does, you know, which is to uh, describe and evaluate that work to think about how it relates to the world around it and so forth and so on. Essentially doing more TJ Demos. Um, but I thought, you know what, we've already got TJ Demos. And actually there's a lot of other really sharp art historians who are writing about ecologically oriented art. So I thought, um, you know, I don't know that the world needs one more of those. Maybe I could try something else and maybe do something a bit more like what the artists and activists that TJ Demos writes about do. Um, but to do that as an art historian, to figure out um, how art history could change. Um, one of the, the great themes um, that arises among a lot of people who think about climate change and global warming and um, you know, mass extinctions and so forth is that we need to change the ways that we live. Um, and that applies, I think, to everyone. And that's not just about you know, uh, what kind of food you eat or whether you drive your car or ride your bike. It might also have to do with like what you do as a, as a person with a job. And my job is to be an art historian. Um, so how I do art history might be something that needs to change because of our relationship to um, you know, our environment. Um, and so that, that's what I decided to try to do. I decided to try to um, sort of rethink what art history might be or what it is that I do as an art historian. And so instead of writing about the fine arts um, or about the decorative arts or folk art or architecture, the kinds of things that art historians generally write about, I decided to try to focus my attention instead on humanity's artfulness, which I think appears in everything that we do, and it affects nature anywhere and everywhere, that no matter where you look, and this is what I think the concept of the Anthropocene really means, um, that anywhere you look on the surface of planet Earth, um, if you look hard enough or with the right kind of eyes, you will see a trace of humanity being creative, and human creativity is artful. And so I might be able to use the tools that I have as an art historian to analyze that artistry, even if it's not going to be a conventional work of art, like a painting or a sculpture. So how could I do that? That was um, you know, the kind of epiphany that I had um, that then raised the question of, of how to follow through upon it. So click along to the next slide and we'll keep things going. So the first thing that I had to do was um, to reconceive a drastically expanded concept of art that goes beyond fine art, decorative arts, folk arts, and architecture, um, and, and then attune art history uh, to describe and explain it. Um, and I didn't see a need to necessarily modify all that much of what an art historian does. The, the thing is really that the object of inquiry is, is changing. You're not going to a museum to look at paintings. 
um, as we'll see, you're going out into the world to look at all sorts of things. Um, so I sort of thought deeply about art historical methods, the kinds of things that art historians have in their in their toolkit um, in order to analyze and interpret works of art and to construct histories out of them and to make arguments about them and to defend those arguments with evidence and so forth and so on. Um, so those kind of hallmarks of art historical method um, involve things like matter and techniques, you know, what works of art are made out of, um, what, what you know, different mediums or media they exist within and how they relate to those uh, kind of framing conventions and conditions, um, you know, that sort of thing on the one hand. Um, also thinking about form and style, um, representational strategies, um, how uh, different ways of visualizing the world are brought to bear in and through works of art, that, that sort of um, set of things on the other hand. And then furthermore, thinking about meaning and content, the subject matter that works of art have and how we uh, um, in, interpret them and, and relate to them in order to make them meaningful to us and whether that meaning changes over time and so forth and so on. All of the questions about art as a, as a meaning bearing and communicative um, activity. Um, and then uh, the kind of uh, broader scope of, of identity and context, how art shapes um, how we understand ourselves um, as human beings um, or as members of this or that group or being this or that kind of person. Um, and then the larger kind of contextual factors within which um, uh, art gets made, the kind of social, political, economic, religious, and so forth um, kind of frameworks uh, that are often in place that inform um, you know, how art comes into the world and how it, it shapes the world in turn. So those are the basics, kind of the foundational things that art historians are thinking about all the time. And I just thought, what if I just took those, those tools and instead of going to work um, you know, in a gallery or in a museum, um, if I took them outside and went to work on, on the world as, as such. Um, and that meant thinking about doing something that's a little unusual for an art historian, which is field work. How do I go out into the field more like uh, uh, maybe an anthropologist would or maybe a geologist would um, to study uh, you know, what human beings do in and to nature? Um, and, and that would be my way of researching this expanded concept of art and uh, my way for exploring um, uh, also the artfulness of art history itself, how I could recreate art history and maybe re-envision some of the ways that the kind of knowledge that art historians produce finds its way out into the world. Um, so that was kind of the big mess of methodological problems that I created for myself. Um, and what I want to do from um, here on out is kind of show you some of the uh, answers I've given to those questions of how it is that we're going to um, you know, produce a more environmental art history uh, by, on the one hand, um, studying this expanded concept of art through field work, and on the other hand, kind of reassessing um, how art historians themselves are artful um, you know, beings that transform the things with which they come into contact. So the first uh, project that I wanted to speak with you about is a project called Fieldworks, um, which is a collaboration that my colleague Todd Stewart, who's a photographer, um, and I have been pursuing since uh, 2015. Um, and together, um, Todd and I travel often with students to the deserts of the Western United States to do field work in a really interdisciplinary and, and kind of open-ended way. Um, and we study marks that people leave on the land, which includes everything from a tree stump on a mountain in Nevada that was cut down by a scientist who then discovered that tree was the oldest um, living thing on the planet, which is a kind of amazing um, mistake, um, something like that, um, but also fraudulent artifacts that an anthropologist planted in a cave in New Mexico. Um, and uh, was falsifying uh, the record of, of human inhabitation of uh, the Americas. Um, so all these different places where people do things and leave traces of their activity, um, in those two cases, uh, traces of scholarly activity, of, of researchers trying to understand humanity or understand nature um, and uh, um, doing so in ways that, that caused error um, of, of one kind or another. Um, but that's just two examples. We, we look at a whole wide range of things, as you'll see. Um, and what we do with our research is make exhibitions and publications based on the work that we do together. And so I'm going to show you the results of, uh, of some of that work here in the next couple of slides. So these four images illustrate um, our group doing field work. Um, and uh, 
uh, that's me uh, on the upper left hand side holding the green notebook wearing the green hat um, talking with a, a group of students um, up on um, Wheeler Peak in Nevada which is the mountain where that uh, that tree was cut down um, and then that's me again um, to the right um, at the top uh, making uh, notes in my my notebook um, at the uh, Salton Sea in Southern California um, and uh, then you see a, a page of, of notes of mine um, at the lower left, um, sort of scribbling in my fieldwork notebook, making drawings and writing things. And then the lower right, a collection of those notebooks. I don't know, there's a dozen or so in there. I've made several dozen um, uh, while I go. And um, the fieldwork notebook is kind of my, um, the, the thing that I produce while I'm out doing research, where I'm writing down um, whether it's facts about the places that I'm visiting or descriptions of things that I've seen um, or uh, information to follow up on later um, or more kind of associative writing where I'm just kind of like brainstorming or free thinking about experiences that I've had. Um, a whole wide range of different kinds of writing find their way into those notebooks um, and those sometimes end up in our exhibitions but they always provide a kind of um, a, a thing to which I can return um, while I'm uh, uh, trying to understand something and build up an exhibition or, or write a, an essay or something like that. Um, so these are some kind of action shots of, of field works um, uh, taking place. So you can see a bit of what that looks like um, going out um, into the world to understand things that we encounter there. Um, and then, uh, you know, documenting that, keeping a record of that that can be drawn on later uh, to do other kinds of projects. So here's one of our exhibitions. Um, now this is an exhibition that Todd and I um, pulled together with um, help from Brent Goddard, um, who also works at OU, um, and a group of students who accompanied, accompanied us out into the field in 2015. Um, and what you're seeing here is kind of a large installation that sprawls across um, these four tables. Um, and that installation consists of photographs, of uh, notebooks, of writings of various kinds, um, found objects, uh, souvenirs or objects bought while we were out traveling, um, research materials like books and maps, a um, whole wide range of things that uh, derive from the places that we've visited and the things that we've seen while in the field. And then accompanying that um, on the wall um, is a, a massive text and you can see um, uh, that in, in the installation shots, but then you can see a kind of closer up view uh, at the kind of center bottom of the screen. Um, and that's a, a huge you know, data set that I produced um, in relationship to all of the objects um, that are in the Fieldworks archive, all the things that we bring back from our travels. Um, and so that involves describing things and then sort of characterizing their various kinds of qualities, um, what materials they're made out of, what color they are, um, you know, maybe a mood that they elicit or a concept that they bring up or something like that. Um, and that data set was a way of kind of, of maintaining a loose order um, uh, of all the things in our archive, um, but also of then um, identifying points of connection between objects. And so um, you can see the lower right hand side of the screen, that's one of my notebooks there um, open to a page of notes. And just to the left of it, there's these little tags that give it a number and a color and a symbol. And so what we did was devise a way of kind of navigating the exhibition to make connections between all of the objects on the basis of, uh, you know, qualities that they might have um, or, you know, issues to which they give rise so that what might look like a big mess of stuff um, can actually become like an array or a network that you traverse and navigate as you form your own kinds of connections between the material. So I was really responsible for producing the big text on the wall. And I was thinking of that as an art historical exercise, thinking about the kinds of material and formal qualities, the kinds of meanings, um, the ways in which art gets involved with identity and context, and, and bringing all of that to bear on this stuff that we had gathered or that we had made while um, doing our research, and then making that available to you as a visitor to the museum um, to form your own kinds of connections between things. And so it's a really mixed media installation that includes uh, images, both moving and still. There are some videos projecting you can see in the spaces. There's audio you can put on headphones and listen to field recordings, um, which Brent makes a lot of when we're traveling. Um, there's a lot of Todd's photographs in there. There's my uh, field notes and writings. 
as well. So this really kind of mixed media assemblage of stuff um, that speaks to the places that we've been um, and the kinds of uh, histories that those places have accrued over time um, and uh, all the various ways of understanding those places scientifically, artistically, historically, and so forth and so on. A kind of a big mess of everything that's sort of loosely held together um, by these uh, threads of connection that you get to follow and also fashion for yourself. So that's a typical example of a fieldworks exhibition. The other thing that Todd and I do um, is, uh, is publish our work, um, which uh, um, is a more conventional thing for an art historian to do, certainly, um, and maybe a slightly less conventional thing for an artist like him to do. Exhibiting is maybe more um, you know, Todd's uh, uh, you know, regular practice. Um, but uh, uh, part of the, the inter interdisciplinary collaboration that we have is to kind of uh, do the things that the other person might do as well. Um, so these images here are, are all Todd's photographs. Um, and they illustrate an essay of mine that will be coming out in the next year or two um, about the Salton Sea in Southern California, which is an artificial lake that was created through an industrial accident in the year 1905. And it's now maintained as a kind of wetlands area, um, but it largely contains agricultural runoff from farms in the region. Um, so it's a very sort of toxic and kind of polluted body of water um, in the middle of the desert in in kind of southeastern California, um, just north of the border with Mexico um, and not too far from the Colorado River. Um, and so I've written an essay about this place um, that figures it kind of as a microcosm of human civilization more broadly. Um, and so I talk about the formation of the Salton Sea, which you see in the upper left hand uh, corner there, um, and then the way in which infrastructure, things that humans make in order to inhabit their environment, um, like this waterway here, bringing more water into the farmland, which will then wind up um, full of, of pesticides and so forth and into the Salton Sea. Um, so there's a waterway running through the Algodones Dunes in um, Southern California. Um, and then people live in these places and build up uh, communities in them and then let those communities fall apart as they do. Um, so the upper right hand corner there is uh, an old house from what would have once been a kind of beachfront community that's since been flooded. Um, because of the changing uh, uh, sea level um, of the of the lake. Um, and so uh, thinking about uh, the kind of histories of human occupation and waste, um, then the two images on the lower right, both images of, of farmland um, that's being prepared um, there in, uh, in the desert, an area that wouldn't ordinarily um, be an arable place, but uh, with, with the water that's brought in, it can be. Um, and then at the lower left, a really unlikely thing, there's a library um, in a place called Slab City, which is a, an off the grid community that's mostly populated by kind of anarchist people who live sort of outside of, of sort of ordinary social order. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a library there. So in the essay, what I'm thinking about um, is how all of this kind of goes together, that we modify our environment to make it habitable to ourselves. Um, and then we kind of fight this struggle with the rest of nature um, to maintain that habitability and to provide the energy that we need for ourselves. And then you have people like this group of anarchists who are kind of living in the midst of all of this. Um, and they're sort of politically very much opposed to what's going on. But their agency, their kind of counterpower um, is not really sufficient to uh, to change the larger order of things. So the essay is kind of thinking about civilization um, and seeing the Salton Sea um, as, a, like I said, a microcosm of the larger kind of arc of human civilization. So the title, The Fertilized Crescent, is a kind of pun on the notion of, um, uh, of the fertile crescent in um, like uh, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and so forth, where, um, you know, points of origin for civilization um, in the old world. Um, and I'm sort of thinking about what happens when you introduce um, this, uh, this very kind of artful element, fertilizer, that allows you to artificially create civilization um, on a scale where it otherwise would not really be sustainable. So of course, this land has indigenous occupants. Um, it has a, a, you know, a, variety, a whole variety actually of different tribes, um, including the Cahuilla and the Kumeye uh, people who um, historically have lived in this area and still live there today. Um, but their civilization um, was not as, uh, as large scale or as complex as um, the Western civilization that through settler colonialism arrives um, and starts to transform the land in these really drastic ways. 
um, that are simultaneously like really unsustainable and ecologically really toxic. And then on the other hand, they just keep sustaining themselves and keep persisting. And so I'm thinking about that kind of paradox in the essay and what it tells us about ourselves as, um, as artful creatures who can do great harm to the world, who can work to rectify that harm um, and so forth and so on. So uh, kind of a, a, a big scope topic, civilization as such, um, but treated through the kind of case study of this one artificial lake and the world that's built up around it in Southern California. So moving on to a second collaboration that I'm involved with beyond the Fieldworks collaboration, um, there's a research group here at the University of Oklahoma called Inhabiting the Anthropocene. And it's a very interdisciplinary research group that studies the ways in which human activities affect the rest of nature. Um, and together we publish a blog, which is at www.inhabitingtheanthropocene.com. So you can check it out if you're interested. Um, we also meet as a group and have discussions with one another. And we host visitors to campus who give talks and kind of contribute to our collective research projects and so forth and so on. Um, and for that group, I write um, for the blog mostly about art history and nature and participate in, um, you know, in the general conversation, which includes natural scientists, social scientists, philosophers, humanists, and artists. It's a really kind of open-ended group of people who are just all um, you know, mutually interested in this concept of the Anthropocene and the notion of how we um, you know, modify our environment um, in order to inhabit the planet um, and uh, thinking about the ethics of that, the politics of that, the culture of that, um, and so forth and so on. Um, so that's a, a another group that I'm a part of, and I'm gonna show you um, in the next few slides um, some of the work that I've done that's come out of that uh, that collaboration. So these are just screen captures of two of the blog posts that I've written for the Inhabiting the Anthropocene blog over the years. Um, I've done, I don't know, a couple dozen posts um, in, the, in the five or so years that I've been a part of that group. Um, and uh, um, they have a whole wide range of topics, um, as you can tell just from looking at these two. Uh, and uh, here on the left-hand side, a short essay um, about a fish ladder that's uh, here in Oklahoma. Um, if you go down to the Wichita Mountains near uh, Lawton and Fort Sill, um, there's a, a dam there um, called the French Lake Dam. And it was built um, uh, during the Great Depression um, by the uh, CCC, uh, the Civilian um, Conservation Corps, which was part of the Works Progress Administration that uh, um, President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed into law. Um, and uh, as part of that dam, they constructed what's called a fish ladder. That's that kind of spiraling concrete structure there. Um, and uh, it turns out that there are actually no fish that live in Oklahoma that use fish ladders. Um, the way that these work is that water from above in the lake that's created by the dam flows down that spiraling ramp. And for fish like salmon, for instance, that need to swim upstream in order to spawn, um, they'll eventually find their way to the fish ladder and they'll go around and around and around and up and keep going you know, the way they need to go to reach their spawning grounds. Um, but the irony is that this fish ladder is actually useless, that there's not a single fish here in Oklahoma um, that will take advantage of it. Um, and I was thinking about uselessness and usefulness and how as uh, the climate changes, and as conditions in different places change, um, things that were maybe once upon a time thought of as useless might start to become very useful to us. And so again, kind of our canny and artful sensibilities um, might take over, but also maybe for fish, you know, they might take over as well. Like it may well be that through some kind of uh, climate change um, that suddenly, who knows, maybe salmon are living in Oklahoma and they need to use this fish ladder. So it was an essay in thinking about, um, you know, sort of when, um, the things that we make in the world are kind of useful and useless um, and how there's a kind of temporal um, structure to that. Um, of things being sort of on and off um, or being of value and not and that things that we might think of as um, as obsolete or as pointless um, in the future might be activated and might be very valuable to us. Um, the essay uh, that I've um, uh, sort of screen captured here on the right, um, a very different topic. I was interested um, after Superstorm Sandy um, hit uh, New York City, um, it flooded a, an art bookstore there called Printed Matter. It's one of the best places to buy um, you know, books made by contemporary artists and books about contemporary art. Um, and I was thinking about that as a kind of iconoclastic gesture. Um, we often think of iconoclastic movements as religious movements where people are destroying um, 
images that they find idolatrous. And I was thinking, well, you know, there's a funny way in which we are producing climate change and that the things that we've um, you know, done to the planet are visiting themselves back upon us and are destroying our art. And so I looked at this, uh, this example of this bookstore getting flooded and all the, the art books inside of it getting destroyed um, and compared that to a previous example of a uh, kind of human induced um, uh, disaster which was the uh, flooding of the Arno River um, in Florence in 1966, um, which was a natural disaster and one that wasn't man-made. However, um, uh, there was a whole bunch of, uh, of kind of gross oil that, that people used to burn then for, for heat that found its way into the water and mixed with the flood water and damaged um, all sorts of art um, and all kinds of other records and documents in Florence. And so I was thinking about kind of the history of how human activity uh, in a sense, collaborates with nature to destroy um, works of art. Um, and so this, this amazing image here of an art conservator who's trying to restore an old uh, crucifix that's been flood damaged um, and thinking about the ways in which our, uh, you know, uh, our impact on the planet um, has effects on art and that we, um, by, say, driving our car rather than riding our bike, are choosing to destroy works of art, um, whether we know it or not. Um, by doing things like amplifying the damage causing power of a hurricane that might hit New York City or something along those lines. Um, so these are just a couple of examples of some of the things that I've written for the uh, Inhabiting the Anthropocene blog. As you can see, like very different topics, but all related to how art and artfulness connect up with, uh, you know, with nature and with, uh, you know, the human impact on it. This is a really busy slide, so I'll walk you through it. Um, but uh, uh, it ultimately is a small um, book that I've uh, um, sort of self-published as a kind of art object. Um, and it derives from three um, blog posts that I wrote for the Inhabiting the Anthropocene blog. And you see those at the top, again, kind of screen captures of the, the titles. So um, then on the right-hand side, uh, a couple of photographs that I made um, while I was traveling in Italy, especially Southern Italy, um, and then uh, to the left of that, sort of the center bottom, um, some of my field notes from um, some travel that I did, um, again, same travel in, in, in southern Italy, uh, then a few copies of this, this booklet that I've produced and the first page of the, the text on the far left-hand side there. Um, and the little booklet is called Of Vulcanism, Art Historically. And it's a, a sort of strange essay that combines these various blog posts and other writings along with um, photographs and some field notes um, to think about how art history relates to geology and specifically to volcanoes. So if you know your European geography, you know that there are a few volcanoes in southern Italy and that Mount Etna, which is actually the one that you see the photograph um, on the upper right hand side is of uh, people walking around um, on a, a crest of Mount Etna, which is in Sicily. Um, and Vesuvius, which is in Campania near Naples, um, which famously erupted in Roman times. Um, those two volcanoes in particular are especially well known. There's a third active volcano called Stromboli um, that's out on, on an island in the Mediterranean. Um, so it doesn't have quite the same history of, uh, of damaging human civilization because it's more sparsely populated area. Um, but both Etna and Vesuvius have um, long and complicated histories involving, um, you know, uh, the human relationship to them. Um, and one of the things that I was really attracted to in thinking about volcanoes um, is that they're really powerful things that our arts actually struggle to resist. We've transformed the planet in so many ways, and we've made nature behave in the ways that we want it to in so many different ways. Um, but our arts are kind of useless against volcanoes. Um, you know, we can try to move lava around, but we really don't have good, good tools for doing that. Um, it's as if the planet wins in this case. Nature is stronger than us. And so I found that um, really interesting to think about as a kind of limit to what our crafty practices are capable of doing. If, you know, Vesuvius wants to erupt, it's just going to erupt. We don't know how to stop it. And we don't really know how to do anything except get out of the way. Um, and so we might create alerts and warnings and things like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, the volcano is going to win. It's a bit like here in Oklahoma, the tornado is going to win. You know, we don't know how to spin it back the other way or something like that. Um, some of these natural forces 
um, simply remain stronger than our ability to control them. And I found that really uh, interesting to think about. Um, but at the same time, I was also noticing as I was reading about the histories of these volcanoes and of the people who have lived kind of underneath them in one way or another, um, that the history of my discipline of art history is really bound up with these locations, that a lot of interesting art historical things have happened, um, or visual things, um, things to do with visual culture, um, and also just with culture more broadly, mythology and so forth, um, have involved these, these two volcanoes in southern Italy. And so I wrote about how um, throughout history, going back to Greek and Roman times, um, the visual and the art historical have been bound up with um, volcanic things in terms of thinking about um, you know, buildings that are made out of volcanic rock, but also about art historians who have done research in these areas, excavating at Pompeii, for instance, or writing about um, the art of these areas. And so it's a kind of uh, uh, maybe sort of poetic essay that I've written that maneuvers around and through a whole variety of different histories in this region. Um, and what they have meant to various kinds of people at various times, um, arguing that in, at the end of the day, that uh, art history has its origins in volcanoes because everything on the surface of this planet does for the most part, except for, I guess, meteorites. Um, you know, all of the things that we think of as populating the surface of this planet um, come from volcanoes originally in one way or another. Um, they're coughed up from the earth, life on this earth has volcanic origins. And so that means that, oddly enough, art history has volcanic origins. And so I wanted to think about that, like I said, in a kind of open-ended, kind of quasi-poetic way. So I wrote this little um, booklet that I've self-published and looking for opportunities to exhibit or to republish someplace else. Um, that's another project that's come out of the Inhabiting the Anthropocene group, thinking about the geological and its relationship to the art historical. So recently I've begun to explore a range of other media in which it's possible to do art history. And I wanna conclude this talk with two recent works. One of them is still in progress. Um, the first project, uh, which is, is more or less complete, is called The Desert. And it derives from my fieldwork with Todd Stewart, um, that fieldworks project that I spoke of earlier. Um, when I'm out in the field, and this is in the desert, um, I regularly perform a writing exercise in my fieldwork notebooks where I transcribe any language that persists in my mind while I'm perceiving in an open but rigorous manner. So what that means is I'm you know, sitting somewhere or standing somewhere or walking around or I'm in a car driving around, something like that. Um, and um, I'm paying attention to my surroundings, to the environment around me. And the words that just almost of their own accord float up into my mind as necessary to capture in some way, um, to write down um, as a record of that place while well, I write them down. Um, and the result of doing that, and I've done this countless times now, um, is a kind of reorientation of one of the basic things that art historians do, which is describing things, description. Um, and I've pulled all of this description into a single document um, and uh, the texts of each version of the exercise are kind of all collected together um, that I've performed so far. And I think I'm kind of done with the piece. Um, it's, it's long enough now to give a reader the idea of what I'm up to. Um, and to date, I've presented it as a video piece, actually, that scrolls through um, the entire 20,000 plus words um, over about a two and a half hour uh, loop. It goes over and over again. Um, and ultimately, I'm planning to publish the text somewhere as a kind of, a, you know, book or something like that. Um, so I'll move to the next slide here and, and you'll get a chance to see um, what this looks like and to read some excerpts from it. So on the left hand side here is an image um, of an exhibition that, uh, that Todd and I had as Fieldworks um, called Beyond Measure at Oklahoma Contemporary, which is a museum or an art space up in Oklahoma City. Um, and this is kind of the, the title wall that, that introduces the exhibition. And so we thought to uh, uh, include the, the text explaining the show and then one of Todd's photographs and one example of my writing as a nice kind of introductory point to the show. So this uh, photograph of Todd's of this enormous pine cone. Um, and then the video screen there is my text scrolling through um, kind of like the credit sequence of a, of a film or something like that. 
Um, and uh, on the right hand side are just two really brief excerpts from the larger text. Like I said, it's about 20,000 words. It takes two and a half hours, which is like a long movie um, to sit through the whole thing. Um, and so you wouldn't necessarily know from reading these exactly where I was. Um, I'm not trying to describe a place in a way that you could recreate it in your mind. Um, like I said, instead, I'm just paying attention to the words that insist on themselves to me um, in some way while I'm uh, while I'm, you know, experiencing the world. Um, and the goal is that the final text should be as kind of complicated and mystifying and strange as I think the actual world is. I think the world is a very complex place and that we like to oversimplify it um, and that we often use art as a way of doing that by reducing the world to a picture um, or reducing the world to a description. Um, and then we also use all of our many arts, all the things that I've been talking about, um, as uh, you know, tools for intervening in the world. Um, and we tend to do that intervening with a very limited understanding of the places where we do it. In other words, we tend to act without really understanding the complexity of our circumstances and of the environment. Um, and so what I've wanted to do with this writing is in a sense to describe the world in a way that restores to it all of the strangeness and unfamiliarity and paradox and confusion that our minds tend to want to strip away in order to give ourselves a very coherent experience of things. And so the idea here is to not only rethink how the art historical tool of description can operate, um, but also what art history is for here. Um, I'm not necessarily describing again a painting or a sculpture, um, but instead using the, the skills of an art historian to produce something that helps us to understand the world in a different way. Um, and so that's the kind of goal of this particular text called The Desert. Um, and the title, The Desert, might seem obvious enough. I'm spending time in the desert, and so I'm, I'm naming the, the text after it, um, is also the name of a text by an art historian named John C. Van Dyke, um, who spent time in some of the same desert landscapes that I have, um, but he did so over 100 years ago in the 1890s and early 1900s. Um, and he wrote a very beautiful book um, about the desert, and it's also called The Desert. So in kind of homage to my predecessor, um, desert art historian, um, I've, I've borrowed his title for my project as well. Um, so that's this piece, and I'll, I'll show you one more and then bring things to a, to a close. So I'm also currently working on editing and configuring a video installation project featuring footage that I shot in South America. Um, its theme is movement, and the piece is called Moving. Um, and I'm focusing on all kinds of transformation and change that involved motion or ways of controlling motion, um, including the origins of civilization in Peru, Spanish colonialism in the Americas, um, Charles Darwin's research that led up to the theory of evolution, which he did in the Galapagos Islands, um, and so on. Um, so a really wide-ranging mix of stuff, but as you can see, some kind of themes are recurring, things like civilization, things like um, colonization, things like research and its impact on nature, and so forth and so on. Um, I've written several short texts um, that are based on that travel that I did, and I've read those aloud, actually kind of like this, um, as a voiceover that accompanies uh, multiple screens that show images I made in Ecuador and in Peru. Um, and when the pandemic is, is over, um, which will come someday, um, I'm, I might present this piece as a, as a work to install in a gallery, uh, but I really made it more just to sort out the format of this kind of video installation um, as a way of maybe working in the future, kind of in addition to the sorts of multimedia installations that Todd and I do, or some of the more kind of experimental publishing type work that I've been doing. Um, and so it's really a way to work that out. Um, and I'm currently planning, now that I've done so, uh, a new video project that'll be about water pollution in Southwest Colorado um, that I'm going to produce soon. That's kind of my post-pandemic project that I'm, I'm itching to get to. So here are six images that are just screen captures from the video content that I produced, um, and one example of one of the texts that I've written, um, which is, uh, in this case, uh, a bit about mapping um, and the first time the Galapagos Islands show up on a map and how that um, 
you know, connects up to the place itself and um, various kinds of scientific theories about uh, how continents form and things like that, a whole range of different themes. I'll let you read it on your own time if you want. Um, but basically, if you were seeing this work in exhibition, you would be hearing my voice reading a text like this. There's about 35 or so um, you know, uh, texts in total, and the whole kind of uh, uh, reading of it all takes about 90 minutes to go through, um, so about feature-length film. Um, but instead of there being just one screen like you'd have in a movie theater, there'll be, I think, four to five um, different screens that are presenting different images. So you'd see something like this clustering of images here. Um, and so those images would then be uh, almost like a big collage of video that you would have to kind of navigate on your own and sift and sort and make connections, um, a bit like the um, installations that uh, Todd and I do as field works. Um, so just to take you through those six images there and give you a a sense of what you're looking at. The upper left is the Pacific Ocean, um, very blue Pacific Ocean near the equator, um, uh, near the Galapagos Islands. Um, in the middle on the top are the Andes Mountains in Peru, not too far from Machu Picchu. Um, and actually the image um, at the upper right is of some stonework, um, some Inca stonework at Machu Picchu. Um, then below that is a, is a Galapagos tortoise, um, kind of making its way through um, some very green water. Um, and then in the center at the bottom um, is a, a hotel, actually. And it's just a transitional space where you're sort of both indoors and outdoors. Um, it was a hotel that I stayed at in, in Peru. Um, and then uh, at, at the, the lower left is a kind of an urban scene kind of zooming through um, the outskirts of Cusco, um, which is one of the major cities in Peru. So images from um, from the Galapagos Islands, and kind of the Andes region, um, so Ecuador and Peru being the two uh, countries. Um, and you can, you can see that you can start to connect these up to one another in various ways. Um, so the, the three bottom um, images are all um, things that involve dwelling, right? Like houses that people might live in or hotels that people might stay in or the shell that a tortoise might live in. Um, you can think about um, Machu Picchu and its relationship to the Andes Mountains, the, the structures made out of stone are made out of the stone, obviously, that the mountains are made out of. You can think about the relationship between mountains and ocean um, or the different kinds of water that the sea is versus the um, fresh water that this, uh, this tortoise is navigating through. Um, you can think about um, the core theme, of course, being motion. Um, and you get that uh, as the, the vehicle that I was in is zooming through Cusco in the lower left or this tortoise making its way very, very slowly through um, the landscape. So um, there are all these different ways that the images might relate to one another and that you might start to make meaning out of them. And as you listen to the voiceover um, that's playing out as I speak and kind of tell stories and describe things and uh, offer explanations of things and, and theorize things, all the things that art historians do, um, those images might come to life in various different ways. And the fact that they're all looping on different screens, um, showing different kinds of content, some of it in black and white, some of it in color, some of it moving very quickly, some of it moving very slowly. I've sped up and slowed down the playback in various places. Um, means that you're kind of navigating and making meaning for yourself. Again, um, like the, the previous text, The Desert, or like really all of this kind of creative art historical work I'm doing, um, offering to the audience the opportunity to continue the thought process that I've put into motion um, by creatively um, utilizing art historical skills. And here's just one final um, clustering of images from that same video project called Moving um, that again show you how you can, you know, kind of constellate or structure um, relationships between different images. Um, you've got on the upper left um, part of an Inca temple, um, a kind of uh, um, altar inside of a, a temple space. Um, then beneath that, um, you've got uh, a little bit of rock in the Galapagos Islands. Um, to the right of that, two newspapers from a, a hotel in um, Ecuador um, that, are, that are titled The Universe and Commerce. Um, so kind of big themes, right? Um, and then the upper right, um, a bit of uh, kind of political um, advertising um, on the side of a building that's calling for direct democracy in an upcoming election um, in, in Peru. Um, and so thinking about how 
uh, things like stone maybe um, you know can connect the natural to the human, or things like commerce and politics and economics um, you know help uh, us to understand, but also to shape the universe and so forth and so on. These are the kinds of you know things that I'm thinking about as I'm doing these more creative um, art historical projects that are taking this really expanded concept of art um, as the horizon for my thinking. Um, and so I wanted to just end on this slide to show you kind of the full mix of things that are that are in play there. Um, you know, the ways in which we take the earth and transform it by carving a piece of stone to make it into an object that has a certain kind of meaning um, to certain people at certain times and in certain places, the way in which we shape our affairs in the present through our kind of political activities, um, the way in which we document and keep a record of what we do through something like a newspaper. Um, and then at the end of the day, the planet itself, things like water, um, things like, uh, you know, islands or ecosystems or habitats and how they're affected by, um, you know, all of our kind of cultural and, and economic practices and the ways that they give meaningful form to the material world. Um, I think that's a good note on which to, to draw things to a conclusion and um, just ask you to, uh, to think about, uh, you know, on the one hand, um, your own activities as artful creatures. You might not think of yourselves as artists, but you are. You use various kinds of theory and practice in your life in artful ways um, and to uh, pause more often than you might otherwise do to think about um, what they do to the environment in which you find yourself and how they give shape to your surroundings. Um, and to use art history um, for all of its intended purposes to understand works of art, which is of course delightful, um, but also to think about how um, maybe more creatively, you can put the skills that you've gained from taking an art history class um, to work in all manner of places. Um, art history is not just useful when you're in a museum or in a gallery. I think it's useful for thinking about literally every single activity that we as human beings undertake. And so on that note, um, I'll leave you to go back over the slides if you want to. Um, and feel free to reach out to me and contact me if you have any questions um, about uh, any of this work that I've done. Um, I'm on the OU um, School of Visual Arts uh, webpage. I'm not hard to find. So thanks a lot.